All right. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, is everybody warm? If you're not, I've got something that'll just warm your heart. How many of you remember the old show, This Is Your Life? Several seasoned saints. Thank you. Well, you're in luck because today we are going to have an episode of This Is Your Life. And we're going to present a special young man who is a devoted Christian doing and going about doing God's work. We are going to present him with This Is Your Life. And that person is, it's me. Yes, it's me. And what we're going to do is just unlike the old show, we're going to have people just out of the blue, friends, relatives, co-workers, just stand up and just share a few good words about everything that I've been doing. So <laughs> let's get started. Uh, is there anybody that would like to share? I'd like to share. Mrs. McGillicuddy, my next door neighbor. I think we've been neighbors for, what, 25 years. Good to see you. Thanks. Uh, I just have one thing. When, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was so scared. I didn't know what to do, and I came here, and you prayed with me, and you said that you would pray for me, but you haven't even asked me how I'm doing. Did you even pray? It's, it's funny you mention that, because uh, I was just thumbing through my Bible a couple weeks ago, and I saw a prayer card with your name on it. You know, you said you would be there for me. You would help me. And the other day, when it snowed, did you help me? Did you see me out there struggling, trying to shovel? No. You didn't help me. I sincerely apologize, and it, it's a big misunderstanding. Uh, my snowblower ran out of gas. Really? At the property line? I hope you guys remember her in your prayers this week because she's really going through a hard time. Um, anyone else? I'd like to say something. So, do you remember who I am? Maybe. Can you give me a hint? Wow. Let's see. You were my high school Sunday school instructor. Yeah. Yeah. So you were there every Sunday while I was struggling to fit in. I did not feel accepted. I didn't feel loved. Do you know how terrible it is to dread coming to Sunday school and to dread coming to church every Sunday just because you don't feel accepted? Do you know how terrible that is? Gosh, ugh. One word, youth pastor. That's the youth pastor's job. They're supposed to get youth connected and get them involved in all these teen activities. And, and I apologize if you didn't take the initiative wow. to get to know your youth pastor. Plus, do you know how long it takes to prepare a Sunday school lesson? <sighs> Teenagers, don't you love them? Okay, I think we have time for one more. Is, is there anyone out there? Oh, Mary, it's good to see you. Haven't seen you for a while. How's um your son? Johnny. Johnny, yes. How's yeah. Johnny doing? Um, well, these last few months have been really hard since Johnny's dad passed away, and, and you know this, and I've, I've been working extra hours and really trying to just get our family back together, but it's been really rough on Johnny, and... Um, do you remember when we met uh, a couple months back and we talked about how Johnny was going to need a mentor in his mm -hmm. life and, and how you would be great at that? And I thought we kind of came up with a game plan, but I, I, I thought I could count on you. And Mary, Mary, Mary. As soon as we had that conversation, I sat down and I wrote down the names of three people that I thought would be a very good mentor for Johnny. But you never got back with me. I never got back with you. I oh, just it doesn't even 
Hey, I still have the list. Just give me a jingle sometime. Oh. That's awkward. Okay. Well, anyway, I appreciate all of you people spending this special time with me. Uh, we laughed a little. We cried a little. But, hey, we had fun. But uh, next week, when we get together... Hey, I got something to share. And you are? I am the guy that you pass every day on your way to work. Yet, you never seem to notice me. I'm hungry, and I'm thirsty, and I'm cold. But you never seem to acknowledge, and I'm, at least, and yet, you never care about me. You know, I, I could give you money, but that would not solve your problems. It basically comes down to one thing. You need to get a job. You have not a clue about my life and what my story is. Hundreds of people pass you every day. Why are you picking on me? Mike, this isn't really about you. I've called you to be my hands and feet. You're here to be salt and light. There are lost and hurting people everywhere. Take a look around you. Fields are ripe for harvest. When God's people are in need, you need to do something about it. For it's written in my word. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters. If someone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and doesn't have pity in their heart, how can the love of the Father be in that person? Let us love not with words or speech, but with action and in truth. I've called you to love one another, to serve one another. You are my hands and feet. And what are you going to do about it? Young man, my name is Mike. What's your name? Floyd. I owe you a sincere apology. I'm sorry. Do you forgive me? My wife's cooking some chili. I sure would enjoy it if you'd come to my place I'd sure enjoy and sit that. at my table. I'd sure enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank, I want to thank Anna Gallagher for putting that together, Pastor Jeff and the people that participated. Uh, I also want to, she's going to Columbia and she, her life has been revolutionized. She was the one here that the youth pastor didn't do his job for. And, uh, uh, and so she took off, she was in the, she was in the skit. And, and uh, so she's going off to Columbia and she's got a call of missions on her life. And she was telling me, share with me all the wonderful things, God, she went there with youth for a mission and uh, the, the poverty that she deals with all the time. And I thought to myself, I know this congregation, wouldn't it be something if we gave a dollar blessing to give this money, this dollar blessing to her to take it because she's spirit led young lady and give it to her and say, now, as God leads you, I want you to minister with this money because money does make a difference. Just like buying that, that, that poor man a, a meal. So I'm going to ask some of the guys to grab right quick. And if you got a dollar to pass or whatever, you can do so. <clears throat> and I understand that a lot of people don't carry cash. It's okay. Just pass your credit card down the aisle and be all right. <clears throat> she can use that in Columbia, I'm sure. 
because the drug cartel might get your credit card number and you might have some other charges on there if she takes it, so. Okay, it's 2017, we're about done, right? And there's work to be done. We're salt and we're light. The Great Commission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And we are still here. The Bible calls it the day. The day is here, but there comes a day, when the time when the day will end and night will come. So we, the Bible says to work while it is day, for the night comes when no one can work. And how do you know we need to go out and work and we need to love people. See, evangelism doesn't happen until your heart is right and you minister to the felt needs and the people out of compassion, just the way Jesus did, caring about every person. How many know that's true? And so many times, uh, the pastor gets up and says, now come on, we got to go out there, you got to talk to everybody, you got to get fired up, you got to go tell people about Jesus because there's heaven and there's hell and everybody has to have Jesus because he's the only way. And that's true. But so many times, we get left behind with just our strength, we get pumped up and it's an external drive that we go out and before long it just fizzes away because there's something missing on the inside. Now, I want to talk to you today about phrases that appear over and over, over and over in the Old Testament many times and also mentioned in the New Testament. And there's some spiritual truth in it that I want you to grab a hold of. And I'm going to encourage you to grab a pen and write down some notes, at least write down the verses to look back at. As Pastor Zach says, note cha- takers are world changers, so it's good to write something down. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings 3. And then hold your finger at 1 Kings 3 in the Old Testament, and then Numbers 27, chapter 27. 1 Kings chapter 3 and Numbers verse 27, and the message title is In and Out. We're going to talk about going out and coming in. The phrase that we see several times in the Bible, and you need Scripture to look at to understand what it's saying. And so we're going to take a look at that. I, I, I want us today to understand that we're called to go out into the world but we also must come in and understand this. I want to ask you a question. What, why did Solomon, what did he ask God for? What did Solomon ask God for? For wisdom, all right? And why did he ask God for wisdom? Why? Okay, the Bible tells us very clearly why he asked God for wisdom. We're going to look at that today. And so we're in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5 to 9, and one of the most accurate translations of the, both the Hebrew and the Greek and for a translation, biblical translation has this, these, some of these verses really well, and this is the New American Standard Bible, NASB. It's a great translation, and that's what I'm reading from in this particular text. It says, In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. Wouldn't you like that if God came to a dream and said, hey, you can have anything you want. What do you want? We'd think like the genie in the bottle. We'd go, oh, uh, let's see. Let me mark this down. And we can think of all kinds of things we're going to ask for. And then Solomon said, you've shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father. Remember, David, King David, is Solomon's father. And, And Solomon says, you've shown great kindness to your servant David, my father, according as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart towards you. And you have reserved for him this great loving kindness that you have given him a son, speaking of himself, Solomon, to sit on his throne as it is this day. That's what's happened. That's me. I'm Solomon. Now, O Lord, my God, Solomon says, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. And yet I am but a little child. See that? Yet I am but a little child. And look at these words. Mark them in your Bible if you have NASB or mark them. If you have it, it says it differently. Write these words down. He says, I do not know how to go out or come in. Solomon says, I'm like a little boy. I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. Uh, Your servant is in the midst of your people, which you've chosen, verse 8, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? In other words, in verse 8, he says, all these people are here. It's a great big deal. In verse 9, he answers 
uh, God's wish, what would you like? He says, discern. He says, I need wisdom to rule the people. What a great thing that he asked for. And obviously, Solomon's not talking about doorknobs. He's not talking about, I don't know how to go out, get the doorknob, or I don't know how to come in, work the doorknob. It's not what he's talking about. Uh, Solomon says, I don't know how to come in. I don't know how to go out. My father, David, he knew how to do this, but I don't know how. And that's why I need wisdom. I need the wisdom to know how to go out and come in. So in a minute, we'll see what he's talking about. Now turn to Numbers chapter 27, Numbers 27. Here, Moses is talking to God about a new leader for the children of Israel. Moses is talking to God, the children of Israel. He's been the leader and he, they need a new leader. Verse 15, Numbers, Numbers 27, 15. Moses said to the Lord, may the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community. Other versions say our congregation. They say congregation, over this congregation. Verse 17, to go out and come in. Notice the leader appoints someone to go out and come in before them. See there, there it is again. One who will lead, there, here it is again, lead them out and bring them in. What is he saying? Bring them out, lead them out rather, and bring them in. So the Lord's people, in other versions it says, or the congregation of the Lord. So understand, it's God's people, the worshipers of God, will not be like sheep without a shepherd. I need to know, I, we need a leader who knows how to go out and come in, lead the people out and lead the people in. This is a leader we need so that the people are not, are, are, are not left without a shepherd. That's what Moses is saying. In other words, he's saying, we need a new senior pastor. Some of you are thinking the same thing. That's why you voted 99.5% for Pastor Jeff. And you know, some of you look at me sometimes like, you're looking a little old there, Pastor. Time to roll all over and you know, ride out in the, in the, out in the take off. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know, uh, Elsa? Did anybody invite Elsa to Iowa? I don't know what's going on. Uh, I think it was Jeannie Hill. She invited Elsa to Iowa. You know Elsa? The ice girl, you know, shooting the cold at us. Y'all feel a little icy today, so warm up to me, will you? <laughs> Moses is saying, I'm retiring, but I need a successor that knows how to come in and go out. And uh, I want him to know how to lead my people in, out, and lead them back in. Deuteronomy 31, verses 1 and 2. Revised Standard Version, Joshua becomes uh, Moses' successor. Here's where, here's Moses saying this. Now Joshua is going to become Moses' successor. And here's Moses speaking in verse 30, chapter 31, verse 1. So Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I'm 120 years old. I'm not that old, but Moses was at the time. I'm 120 years old this day, and I am no longer able to go out and come in. He's not talking about go outside to the outhouse and come back in to the living room. That's not what he's talking about. Here's the same phrase again. I'm no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. Moses says it's time to retire and we need a leader because I can no longer go out and come in. I can't come in or go out. I'm 20 years old today. And so it's like his, his retirement message to the church. If I could still come in, if I could still go out, then I would keep on leading, but I can't, I'm not able. And uh, uh, I've already spoken, he says, I've spoken to God, you know, Moses is saying, I've spoken to God to, to make sure the new leader can, knows how to go out and he knows how to come in because this is so important. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28, six is another one. Mark it down in your notes. Deuteronomy 28, 6 says, you will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. He's not saying, you know, you're in your living room and in the morning you go out to work and you're going to be blessed when you come home. You're going to be blessed when you come in. It's like you walk through the door, you're getting blessed you, as you go out and you come back in. There's the blessing threshold, the door. He's not talking about that. There's something else that he's saying, okay? And uh, uh, John 10, 9, Jesus said, look at this, this is in the New Testament. Jesus said, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out. There it is. They will come in and go out and find pasture. When he says find pasture, when they go out, it's provision. In other words, when they go out, they'll have everything they need. You see, we're called to go into the world. We're called to take the gospel. We're called to go in the name of Jesus, right? But we need something before we go. We need to first come in to get what we need before we can go out. 
You know, there's an old song that says, come into the holy of holies, enter by the blood of the lamb, worship at his throne, come into him. And now when we leave, we've seen the Lord and we're changed and there's a power in us that is different. And uh, uh, if you turn, let's, let's look at one more. Turn to Joshua 14. Joshua chapter 14, verse 11, or mark it down. Joshua 14, 11. Here it is again. I am still, Joshua said, I am still as strong today as I was in the day Moses. And this is Caleb, rather, speaking to Joshua. Caleb speaking to Joshua. I am still as strong today as I was in the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now. For what? What does it say? For war and for going out and coming in. For war, for going out and for coming in. And, and, and uh, going out and coming in were military terms. They're warfare. They refer to warfare. Moses says we need a leader that knows how to lead the people out to war and bring them in from war. And Solomon says, God, my father David, he knew how to go out and he knew how to come in, but I don't know how to do it. You see, remember, everything that happened in the Old Testament happened literally, but for us, it's a spiritual picture. So, are we in a war? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places. We're in a spiritual war. Absolutely. For your soul, the souls of your family, the souls for your neighbor, for a world, a war for spirituality in our nation and around the world. We're in a war, and the, and the enemy is against us. We'll always be in a war. We need to know how to go out to war. We need to know how to come in. Now, what is this referring to us today? What in simple terms? Listen to me. Here's what it's saying. Going out is witness. Coming in is worship. It's knowing how to worship and knowing how to witness. Because when you worship like Isaiah he saw the Lord. He was high lifted up. His train filled the temple. The glory of the Lord filled the place. And what did he do? He fell down and cried, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people that are unclean. And he cried out to God. And he'd been declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. He's worshiping God. And the presence of God is mighty there. And he leaves there. He gets up and he's different because he encountered the powerful presence of God. Until you experience worship and the presence of God and the Spirit of God upon you where you see your humanity and you see God's glory, you'll never have what you need when you go out until you come in and worship him deeply in spirit and understand that. Jesus said in John 4, they, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What's truth? The singing declaration songs of theology and truth. It is important. Like on cross the solid rock I stand that we sing today. You know, not a lot of maybe spirit in it, but if all we ever do is sing spirit songs, then we can do those. They're pretty shallow. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. If you want to sing something with some meat, sing holy, holy, holy. You want to sing something to me, sing, what a mighty fortress is our God, right? And we can go on and on and, and, and talk about that. And there's new songs that are being written. It's not just the older ones that are, that are great meat songs. But we also need to not just sing declaration, but we need to learn how to go into the presence of God and meet with God and have God engulf us and come around us and, and be changed from the moment of true, deep spiritual worship. You see, the reason that the people of God the reason they came in from war was to be refreshed. They come in. They would always come to the house of God. They'd offer sacrifices of worship to God. Why? Because they were renewed. They were refreshed. They were strengthened. They would come in and worship and be refreshed. So the Bible teaches us the strength, the joy, the pleasure of the Lord is with us. Psalm 16, 1 says, you, sh you, sh uh, you will show me the path of life. And in your presence, God, is fullness of joy. In the presence of God, there's joy. The joy of the Lord is what? Our strength. In the presence of God is joy, right? Psalm 1611. And in thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. There's pleasures forevermore at the right hand of God. To be in his presence, guys. And I'm going to tell you what. Many times we come in here, we sing a song. We don't worship. We don't enter into his presence. We're just around people. We're just there. We're distracted. Cell phones going, this, that, talking, doing whatever. And we're not focused. We're not worshiping God. We're not in tune. You should be tuned when you come in. Pastor, somebody spoke on that already. I don't remember which one of them because I'm too old to remember that stuff. But one of them did probably Luke. He's the one that's got the knowledge. 
Right, Luke, you don't just have the hair, you got the knowledge, right? So now that we're, we're, we're sitting here in Joshua, let's go over, like, you know, Old Testament, Joshua, Joshua, then Judges, Ruth, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. I don't know why Joshua's judging Ruth, but we get there. Then the next one is 1 Samuel. I help you remember where the Bible's books are. Remember Solomon had said, remember Solomon said, my father, he knew how to do this going out and coming in stuff, but I don't know how to do it. First Samuel 18, chapter 18, verse 12 to 16. Now Saul was afraid of David. Notice that. Why? For the Lord was with him. Mark with. God's with you. People will be afraid of you. If God's not with you, there's nothing to be afraid of in you. Right? The Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. Saul didn't have God anymore. David did. Therefore, Saul removed him, removed David from his presence and appointed him as a commander of a thousand. And David, he went out and he came in before the people. Remember, uh, the, the Saul was so jealous because David was slewing ten thousands of thousands and, you know, and, and he was being looked at because God's favor and blessing and anointing was on him. And it says here, verse 14, David was prospering in all of his ways for the Lord was, there it is, mark it, with him. When Saul saw that he was pro pro uh, prospering greatly, he dreaded him. But all Israel and Judah loved David. And the NA, the, the, this version says, and, and he went out and came in before them. Other versions, the American Standard Version says, for he went out and came in before them. Another one says, because he went out and came in before them. In other words, the reason the people loved David, loved him, is because he was full of the presence of God. You know what I love about people? When I see them, I'll tell them a lot. You know what I love about you is Jesus in you, God in you, his presence in you. There's nothing more beautiful than the holiness of God, the power of God, the spirit of God in a person. You can see it. You love him, right? And the people said they loved him because he knew how to go out and he knew how to come in. He knew how to witness and he knew how to worship. He came into the temple, he worshiped. He worshiped by himself. In fact, uh, Solomon himself, uh, you'll see in a minute, had a back stairway into the place of worship where he would fall down prostrate before God and worship God. That's why God's favor was on him. So we see this. Uh, it's very important that we understand he went out and he came in before the people. He knew how to witness and represent God, and he knew how to be with God and worship God. There's three things today. Number one, that I want you to know about worship, about worship. Three things about worship. Number one, worship brings God's presence in our lives. 1 Samuel 18, 12 to 4 again, and keep your finger there. and Don't, don't, don't let 1 Samuel 18 go because we'll be back there. Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with him. We just read it, but had departed from Saul. Therefore, Saul removed him from the presence and anointed, appointed him as a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. David was prospering in all of his ways for the Lord was with him. David understood what it meant to be with God. Do you? David understood what it meant to be with God. We're talking about coming into the presence of God, not going out from the presence of God. We go out with the presence of God. We don't go out from the presence of God. We go out with the presence of God. It's very important to get that. There's no reason for you to go out into the world to try to be a witness without first coming in. Remember what uh, Acts records? That Jesus told them to wait for the promise of the Father, the coming of the Spirit. When the Spirit comes upon you, and, he, and, he, and, and John baptizes in water, but the, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit in fire. He says, when you, when you have this spirit, that he says, when the spirit comes upon you, he'll give you power to be witnesses unto me in J J J Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world. That's the deal. And we go out, we don't have anything. Let me tell you what, Jesus had the fullness of the spirit and he went in the darkness of the world and he shined the light and they crucified him. No wonder we're fearful out in the world without God. Because I want to tell you what, Satan's not afraid of you, but he's afraid of God in you. Jesus in you, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. He's fearful of God in you, and God is in you if you ask him to be. And when you come into his presence, there's something that happens to you that's miraculous, the same as I mentioned that happened to Isaiah when the glory of God filled the temple. It's a changing moment. It's changing. Jesus, when he sent him out, 
In Matthew 28, verse 20, he says, go and preach the gospel, teach it and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things which I command you. Guess what he said? With that, he said, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the world. See, God goes with you. He's the one that cares. It's his anointing that convicts. It's his spirit that changes hearts. We're born again by the Holy Spirit. God is with us. He'll go with us. But first, we have to come in. We have to come in and pray. We have to come in and worship. We have to come in and meet with God and be full of God and go out with the power of God. There's no reason to go out there without the presence of God. Nothing eternal ever happens without the power and presence of God. There's no reason to come in here without coming into the presence of God. If we just come in here to show up for church and mark off attendance and give an offering, what is that? You have the purpose to enter into the presence of God, to worship Him, get rid of the distractions, enter in, meet with Him on a deeper level. David, he went out, when, he, when David went out, he didn't go out without God. David went with God. He went out with God. That's why he was a great warrior. When I was a pastor in Sheldon, they had a little church, and Pastor Kerry, you know, you know this uh, little church because you grew up there. I was Kerry Huplin's youth pastor. And he was really smart, but he was weird. One time I called him when we had an adult party, as a teenager, he was about 17, he was 16. He was hanging upside down like a raccoon looking in our front window from our roof like this. I said, how'd you get up there? Are you going to fall on your head and die? It scared me. But anyway, as I, <laughs> he went to that church, Sheldon, back to Sheldon. So he had, you know, one entry in and one entry out. And I remember a little boy asking me, thinking I lived at the church because when he got there, I was at the door greeting, you know, you know, it was a fairly small church and I'd greet everybody and when they left, I'd be greeting. Every time he came, I was there. He figured I just lived there, you know, but, but guess what? I don't live there. You don't live here. Jesus doesn't live here. Jesus is alive in you, right? And to wherever you go, if you have God, you win. There's power in it. And, 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 and it's, it's, uh, it's not about being in this building. It's about Jesus being in us. And see, Jesus is not saying, I will just stay here in this building. You guys be careful out there. I, I did that once and it didn't work out too well for me. Jesus is not saying that. Jesus is saying, go out and witness. I'm going to be with you and I'll help you. I'll empower you. And uh, boy, you better, you better, uh, you better remember that you, when you go out, you need God. Let me read one more verse on this about uh, the, about the, um, uh, presence of God that uh, when we, we, we uh, are changed by the presence of God. Jeremiah 17, mark it down, verse 19 to 22. This is what the Lord said to me. Go and stand at the gate of the people through which the kings of Judah go in and out. Stand also at all the other gates of Jerusalem. Say to them, hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah and all people of Judah and everyone living in Jerusalem who come through these gates. This is what the Lord says, be careful not to carry a load on the Sabbath day or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. Do not bring a load out of your houses or do any work on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath day holy as I command your ancestors. Sabbath was Saturday. Colossians teaches us that the Sabbath was a picture of the day of rest or the rest that he, God wants us to enter into, the rest of that God wants us to enter into. And we worship on Sunday, it's the resurrection day, and it's the Christian day to come and worship God and set aside. But God still wants us to set something aside. Uh, and why does God harp on this, that one day a week, not to carry a burden, not to work, do anything else, give me the day, why? Because God wants us to give him one day a week where you admit that you can't do it without him where you can't do it without him, you admit it. So worship, worship God. You know, it's the time you come and you lay down your burdens of your family, of raising your kids, of financial troubles, of a work, work problems, relationship problems. Lay down your burdens and come before God and worship God and he renews you. You wait upon the Lord and you'll be renewed like the eagle. You soar. God will strengthen you. God will lift you. God will empower you. He will be with you. Did you know that the word worship means to put your face on the ground? How many knew that in Greek? The Greek is uh, proskuneo. 
which where we get the word prostrate from, to prostrate ourselves with our face on the ground. I'm going to shock you here. I think every day we'd have to find somewhere, or every week anyway, to get on our face before God. And minor bow on our knees, but get on our face before God and cry out to God. It says who He is and who we are. We lift Him up and we humble ourselves before God. And we come and we worship. The Hebrew, the word for in Hebrew, which I can't pronounce, means the same thing. Put your face to the ground. Literally bow down and put your face on the ground. You remember when Satan tempted Jesus, when he took him up on the high uh, pinnacle? Remember that when he, he tempted him? And he, 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 he said, did he, did he say, uh, if you'll worship me, then you can have all this kingdom? Did he say that? No, he didn't say that. You know what he said? He said, if you'll bow down, Satan told Jesus, if you'll bow down and worship. There's something about bowing down. You know, I remember the first time in a public service, I just felt so moved to bow down. And people, my friends were in the service. So we're in that building over there. And I just, I just knelt down, put my head down, and, and the presence of God just overcame me. But you know how the enemy does it like that. So what does he put in my thought in my brain? I wonder, the choir's behind me, I wonder if my underwear is showing. That's the first thing, you know, that's stupid, isn't it? And some of you, you're distracted with all kinds of stuff, you know? But you just have to keep turn, tuning in and turning up. And, you know, and, and I, remember, uh, I remember when, you know, when I was, uh, first time I, I lifted my hand, I was a teenager, back at First Assembly of God in Waco. And the first time I lifted my hands, I'd never done that. And I'd seen it done. My dad's Southern Baptist, he didn't do it. My mom was Assembly of God, she did it. And I looked around. And some of the people that did it were mean. They were gossips. And I thought, ah, that doesn't make you spiritual. And by the way, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't make you spiritual. Uh, uh, that's a different subject. But anyway, when I finally lifted up my hands, it was like a release. I don't know what happened. But you know, it's, it's, that's weird to you. So, uh, it's people, and I thought, well, is everybody going to look at me? You know, and I'm an insecure teenager. Uh, and I was thinking, well, but, but you know, I realized little children, they, they lift their hands to the parents of their grand. My little Paisley one, she loves me. <laughs> She's got grandpa. And she goes, you like this? It melts my heart. You think it doesn't melt the heart of God? And all in the scripture, it says, lift your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. I, I, with it all, you know, lift up your, praise God, right? Clap your hands. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. All that. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not all of his benefits, who heals all your diseases, who, who forgives all your iniquities. He's a great God. If we can see him as great, how do we see him? When we enter into his presence like Isaiah, when he fell on his face before God, and he cried, woe is me. I'm a man of uncleanness. We see God in his greatness and we see our humanity and we cry out, oh Lord, we need you, which is the essence of humility. And God's grace pours upon us and his spirit comes within us and the spirit of praise rises up because the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of himself, the Bible teaches, but only glorifies and speaks of the name of Jesus and to him be all the glory. You know, this, these people up here that lead us, uh, they're not called the song leading team, they're called the worship team because we don't just come to sing songs, we come to worship Almighty. God. Amen? And it declares Jesus is Lord. It declares God is Almighty. And we worship and we lift Him up and we praise Him. What I'm saying to you is God has called us to go out in the world, but we're not ready to go out until we first come in. There are people that are hurting, just like in the skit. There are people that only you can minister to. It might be a neighbor, a co-worker, it might be a relative, whoever it is, and the Holy Spirit wants to use you mightily. But you have nothing unless you go with God. You with me? You have to, we have to go with God. And uh, don't be afraid of worshiping Jesus. We have to come into his presence. It's the best thing we can do, worshiping God, spirit and truth. It brings the presence of God. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. When the people all begin to really praise him, suddenly God shows up in a mighty way. And I want every one of you, listen, every person, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And it's not like, you know, this one, this one, three in that row, but five don't. And these people are singing, these people are lifting their hands. No, everybody should enter in. Everybody should worship. And when we all worship, you're going to see something happen mighty. Amen? A mighty thing will happen. God's presence come with his fullness. So it's all of us. It's the congregation of God. We need to, we need to come in and we need to worship and bow before God. So God was with David, and the Bible says, and that's the presence of God 
uh, it's very important we get that, that uh, worship brings God's presence. God was with David. He was a worshiper. And we need to be worshipers, and God will be with us. The second thing, God, worship brings God's fear in our lives. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and wisdom is the application of knowledge. We know what's good to do, but we don't do it because we don't have the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You want to live wisdom, then wisdom says, if God says it, I'm going to do it, right? It's respect, it's awe, it's reverence. I stand in awe and worship you. That's the fear of the Lord. It's acknowledging his power and his authority. But there's another aspect of fear that I want you to see in this scripture. Remember at this time, Saul, Saul represents David's enemies. And in 1 Samuel, again, I told you to stay there, chapter 18, verse 12, it says Saul was afraid of David. Why? Because the Lord was with David, but he had departed Saul. 1 Samuel 18, 15, when Saul saw how successful he was, and one other version says how he behaved wisely, how David behaved very wisely. It says Saul saw this, he was afraid of him. Do you know why Saul was afraid of David? Well, first off, God's spirit had departed from Saul, but not only that, an evil spirit had come upon Saul. I mean, remember that. There an evil spirit had come upon him. And evil spirits and demons are afraid of God and God in us. What did, what did they do to fix the evil spirit on Saul? They summons David, he played his harp and he worshiped God and the spirit left. Remember that? Worshiping God, the spirit, why? Because when God shows up, the enemy cannot stand. When Christ is there, the enemy departs. And, uh, and so uh, we need to remember that. Let me tell you, Satan is afraid of Jesus. He's not afraid of you. If, you're, if Jesus is with you and his spirit is with you, then, then the devil is afraid. He's not afraid of you a bit unless you have Jesus in you. And when we come in and we worship, we worship Jesus with all of our heart and spirit and truth. It brings freedom. It brings deliverance. It brings victory. And if you have any problem with bondage, you get in the presence of God and you worship. And when you start worshiping, God shows up and he sets you free. Remember the song? Set my people free that I might worship thee. Set my people free that I might praise thy name. Listen. Let all bondage go and let deliverance flow. Set my people free to worship thee. That's my prayer. Set my people free to worship God with all your heart, all your soul, to love him, to worship him in spirit and in truth. See, the best thing you can do is spend time worshiping God to be in his presence. See, Satan is not afraid of you if you're by yourself. It's like the, it's like the bullies. You know bullies are, I, I can't stand bullies. I would hit a 13 year old if he is a bully. Say, Pastor, you can't do that. Yes, I can. I've lived a long life. I'm not afraid of jail. But anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Anybody 13? I'm just kidding. Kind of. Kind of. But the bullies come, you know, and, 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 and they don't know that, that this little guy that everybody picks on is, is friends with the linebacker on the football team. And four or five of them come around him, you know. You've seen it in movies. And they're picking on him and going, <laughs> spitting on him, kicking at him. He's afraid. All of a sudden, Big Joe walks up. Muscles bulging through like Pastor Hawk. You know, <laughs> unbelievable. That guy's like built like a tank. I don't know what his problem is. He, I think he thinks spiritual exercise profits something. I don't know. I don't believe it. But anyway, you can tell I don't believe it. But anyway, he throws that, and the guy comes up and he says, hey, what's going on, fellas? Oh, oh, oh nothing. We just straightened his collar. Just straightening him out. Yeah. Fixing him. He said, they're afraid of him. See, that's the deal. You go out by yourself and no one's afraid of you. The devil's not afraid of you. But you got God. You got your big brother, Jesus. I'm telling you what, the enemy's no match. And the enemy's no match for you. When God really shows up, we really do stand in awe and we worship God. Worship brings the presence of God. Worship brings the fear, the awe of God into our lives. And finally, worship brings God's wisdom in our lives. Because God was with David, God's presence was with him, David had, saw, had wisdom. Because God was with Solomon, God's presence was with him, so he had wisdom. We come in to worship and God fills us up, he inhabits the praise of his people, we go out with God, his divine direction, his wisdom. And I wanna ask you, have you ever needed wisdom for raising your kids? Of course we have, teachers, business leaders, 
uh, people that are neighbors, with other relationships. We need wisdom. And guess what? When you're walking with the fullness of God, wisdom just flows out of you natural as the sweat comes out of your pores when you're hot. Right? I mean, wisdom just pours out of a person that's full of God and the Spirit of God is on them. And that's what was happening with both David and with Solomon after Solomon asked God for wisdom. And uh, in the presence of God, wisdom comes. Solomon said, my dad, he, David, he, had, he was great at this. He knew how to go out and come in. I wish I had what my dad had. So Solomon says, if I can learn how to worship and witness your, uh, you, to your people, if I can learn how to worship and witness, if I could just learn to come in and go out like my dad, David, I can lead your people. So give me wisdom to be able to do all this. And God says, because you asked for wisdom, Solomon, and not riches, honor, or fame, I'm going to give you these also. I'm going to tell you what, now we need to have a heart for God, not what the world can provide us. And, and I'm going to give you riches, honor, and fame, Solomon. You needed wisdom, and I'm giving that too. The Bible says he's the wisest man ever lived. Wisdom comes from being in the presence of God. That's my point. This is about David, 1 Samuel 18, 14. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. He had wisdom to direct, and he had success. Now, Solomon's wisdom, how many know the Queen of Sheba? Isn't it interesting? We'll believe everything we can read in secular books about the Queen of Sheba, but we read in secular history books about God and about the Bible and all that. We just like discount it. Baloney. The Queen of Sheba is mentioned in Scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 9. Mark it down to your notes, 2 Chronicles 9, 1 to 4. Okay, the Queen of Sheba was known throughout the world as the, the, the most powerful queen, the richest queen, the wisest queen, in fact, the wisest and richest monarch, period. Queen of Sheba. Probably came from the same land the wise men came from when they came to Christ. And uh, here's what it says about her. Second Chronicles 9, 1 to 4, 9, verse 9. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, his, his, his fame spread, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with difficult questions. She didn't like it that someone else was thought of greater than her. She, had a very, she came to impress him. She had a very large retinue, which means caravan, caravan with camels carrying spices and a large amount of gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was on her heart. Look at this, verse 2. Solomon answered all her questions, and nothing was hidden from Solomon, which did he not explain to her. In other words, he was a wise, had wisdom. And when the queen of Sheba had seen, well, look at this, the wisdom of Solomon, also the house which he had built, the food at his table, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his ministers and their attire, his cupbearers and their attire, and look at this, and his stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, she was breathless. In other words, she was speechless. In other words, she had no argument. No more argument. She had no answer. He had a secret stairway where he went before God and he worshiped and he fell on his face before God. She had nothing to say, seeing all of his wealth, his wisdom. She'd come to show off how smart and wealthy she was and she went away humbled. And so, especially notice in verse 4, the stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord. She noticed the way Solomon went to worship God to put his face on the ground, and she was speechless. See, worship brings wisdom in our lives. Final verse, Ezekiel 46, 9. When the people of the land come before the Lord at the appointed festivals, whoever enters or comes in by the north gate to worship is to go out the south gate. Whoever comes in or enters comes in by the south gate is to go out the north gate. No one is to return to the gate by which they entered, but each is to go out the opposite gate. If you come in that door, you go out that door. If you come in that door, you go out that door. You don't go out the same door you come in. What's he saying? Don't leave the way you came. Come in the presence of God. It changes you. You won't leave the way you came if you come worshiping God. Anytime you come into my presence, you'll live differently. The takeaway, write it down. Anytime you come into my presence, you will leave different. Worship brings God's presence, God's fear, and God's wisdom. Will you bow your head with me? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Please close your eyes and bow your heads down. I've talked about bowing. Respect God, listen to God. You say, I want to enter into worship in spirit and truth. I want to be a worshiper of God. I want his presence with me. I want his wisdom with me. I want the fear of God with me. 
And I make a commitment to 2018 that when I come, I come worshiping. I enter into his gates with thanksgiving. I enter into his courts with praise. I come and worship him in the holy of holies. I come to meet with God, to worship him with everything within me so that his fullness fills me and I go out and I have something. And I not only do that for Sunday, for the set aside day that God demands, but I also throughout the week. And you're here to say, I want to be that worshiper. Pastor, I'm making a new commitment. All of us are called to it. Come on, raise your hand and say, I want to be that kind of worshiper. I want all in. I want all in with the presence of God. I want all in with the worship of God. If God wants me to raise my hands, I'll raise my hand. God wants me to fall prostrate, I'll fall. God wants me to bow, I'll bow. God wants me to shout unto God with the voice of triumph. I shout unto God with the voice of triumph. I want to praise Him all the day long, day and night. I'm going to praise Him. I, every God is calling every one of us. This is, we need everyone. You and I, everyone. Everyone is called. Everyone needs to be a part of it. And when this church gets a hold of that and worships God in spirit and truth, you're going to see a change like you've never seen before. Because I can't change you, only God can change you. And when you enter into His presence, there's something that's going to happen. Amen? When